Hello and welcome to our service for the 19th of September. We're very pleased that you're once again able to join us today. All our hymns are again in CH4, uh, two are also in CH3, and I'll be giving you numbers so that if you're listening on the telephone, uh, you'll be able to see the words. Now let us worship the Lord. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He said to them, This passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. Well, let us praise God as one. Our first hymn today is from CH4 only, number 283. The voice of God goes out to all the world. Let us pray. God who brings good news, you make our hearts glad with your favour. Our ears hear your words of mercy. Our eyes look and see signs of your presence that in Christ you have come to set the captives free. You cleanse us by your grace, renew us by your spirit. So we put on the garments of praise and sing to you of our thanksgiving. Glory to you, Lord our God, for in Christ you give us the gift of new life. O loving God, generous and holding nothing back, now in shame we confess that we so often fail to live up to your calling. We are mean-spirited and vengeful, those who mourn go uncomforted, and conflict flourishes in our world. 
Those held captive await liberty, whilst we take freedom for granted. The distressed long for a hint of good news, but we stay silent amidst the shouts of protesting voices. We confess our disobedience and plead for your forgiveness. Save your people, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ. So we praise you that we are restored to wholeness through the death and life of Jesus our Lord. In him we find life, and in his words we pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have been following a theme for the past few weeks, which begins on the first pages of the Bible in the Garden of Eden. There God and creation, his creation, dwelled as one. Human beings cared for the garden and God walked among them. There was only one rule that human beings represent God's character and live according to his image and wisdom. But instead, they chose to disregard that rule. They ate from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and instead they chose to live according to their own wisdom, and they fractured that closeness. So human beings were cast out of the garden and away from the presence of God. And yet that early purpose, that all-time purpose, remains the same, that all people should represent God's character and live as his image according to God's wisdom. As we read through the scriptures, we read how again and again human beings choose enmity and death rather than life. So God determines to do something about it. He chooses one man and one family to bless the nations. And from this family, a saviour would come to embody God's promise and restore the unity of heaven and earth. This promise, this hope, is that hope of a new Eden. And it's an image that is repeated throughout the Bible. The trouble is that this family, Israel, are just as bad as every generation, if not worse than everyone before. Reconciliation becomes hard, even impossible, for the people to accomplish. So did God make a mistake choosing this family? And in his determination to work through this family to reconcile all things to himself? Well, no, God has a plan. Out of this family will come a chosen one, a Messiah who will redeem Israel and be the true Israelite through whom Israel will bless the nations and by being Lord over the powers of division. We still see those principalities and powers, as Paul called them, all around us today. Those ways of thinking according to which the world is so often run. Ways of thinking that divide us according to race, wealth, status, colour or creed. And which the nations are established upon. And yet this Messiah of Israel will reconcile the nations as one family. That by unity in our diversity, we should once again represent God's character and by living as his image according to God's wisdom, show that the world's divisive ways shall not hold sway. I want for us to see today something of how in the prophet Isaiah this is all foreshadowed. Now the book of Isaiah is made up of three different works over some time crafted together around a time of deep division in the kingdom. It's a story of judgment 
And it's a story of the hope of return to a new Jerusalem after exile is over. And together these passages, these, these, these works, point to God's redemption in a king who would restore Eden. Seen in the image of the temple in Jerusalem where heaven and earth shall meet. And so that all the nations would live once more in righteousness before God and in peace. In Isaiah, God shows how he is going to do it. But before we look more closely, let's sing again. This time from CH3 at number 312 and CH4 at number 715. Behold the mountain of the Lord. sinful God announces judgment but that judgment will not be the end of the story at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 2 we read this here is the message which God gave to Isaiah son of Amos about Judah and Jerusalem in days to come the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all towering above all the hills Many nations will come streaming to it, and their people will say, Let us go up the hill of the Lord, to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen. For the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem. From Zion he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among great nations. They will hammer their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will never again go to war, never prepare for battle again. Now, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light which the Lord gives us. Even in the face of the trouble and division created by the wrong choices of God's own people, yet the Lord himself will join heaven with earth in the temple on the mountain in Jerusalem. This is indeed a representation 
of a new Eden, a restored Eden, where God is present for his people and his light shows the way. This is an Eden to which all the nations will come and find peace. Isaiah calls the temple a mountain, like a head raised high, to which many nations will come. God's house, therefore, is the counter to Babel. Unity doesn't come through allegiance to the powers of this world, but to the word and the wisdom of God. And of course, this is not just a promise for Israel, but through Israel, the nations shall come together once more and become the family of God. The question is how this can come about when Israel as a nation have fallen so far from the way of righteousness before God. Well, as the book of Isaiah develops, we see that a seed from the line of David rules God's house. It will come through the root of Jesse, one branch upon whom the Spirit of the Lord will rest, who will rule with righteousness. But who then is this Lord? And can God's people learn to listen to him? Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They live in a land of shadows, but now light is shining on them. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His royal power will continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. He will rule as King David's successor, basing his power on right and justice from now until the end of time. The Lord Almighty is determined to do all this. Well, of course, God's people are far too belligerent and divisive and unfaithful to trust fully in the Lord. Their words are false, their values corrupt. Even their devotion to God is too tainted by self-interest and it's an easy trap to fall into. As a result of their divisiveness and in their weakness, they face the consequences of their choices through days of trouble and exile. They would face judgment at the hands of Assyria and then Babylon for their idolatry and oppression of the poor. And this judgment, Isaiah says, would be like a purifying fire where the old corrupt Jerusalem is set aside so that a new Jerusalem can be established. Isaiah's warnings, however, have no effect. The people are far too deep down the rabbit hole of their own creation, so instead, Isaiah's words will have the effect of hardening the people's hearts. Judgment comes and eventually the people are indeed carried off to Babylon. Well, now we jump forward a couple of hundred years. Isaiah's words have come to pass and the exile is over. But this renewed Jerusalem hasn't learned the lessons it should have. Rather, the people seem to have had a crisis of faith in God, asking whether in the light of defeat and exile, God really is as powerful as they thought. So Isaiah's disciples give us words of hope to an Israel that were just as rebellious as their ancestors. They still refuse to be God's servants. So God is going to do a new thing. God's chosen one is going to come and be the servant Israel that the people have failed to be. He is on a mission to restore Israel to their God and to be a light to the nations. Empowered by God's Spirit, he will announce God's good news and establish his kingdom over the nations. That's all great, but what comes as a surprise is how this is going to happen. This messianic servant is going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. But he dies on behalf of the sins of his own people. His death is an atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. We listen to part of the song of the suffering servant from Isaiah chapter 53. 
It was the will of the Lord that his servant grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. But because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with those who are evil. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. The Lord says, My devoted servant with whom I am pleased will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake I will forgive them. And so I will give him a place of honour, a place among the great and powerful. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Although Israel is hostile to the seed, the Lord vindicates his servant, whose future is inextricably intertwined with the future of Israel and of all the nations. It is by his death that he provides a way to put people in a right relationship with God. And yet after his death, he is all of a sudden alive again. The Lord God vindicates his chosen one, his servant from Abraham's line, and through him restores Israel to be the blessing to the nations that he has always called them to be. See then how the nations come to the Lord. We read this from Isaiah chapter 60. Great caravans of camels will come from Midian and Ephah. They will come from Sheba bringing gold and incense. People will tell the good news of what the Lord has done. All the sheep of Kedar and Nebaioth will be brought to you as sacrifices and offered on the altar to please the Lord. The Lord will make his temple more glorious than ever. And so... Jerusalem then will be the place where heaven and earth meet, the new Eden to which all the nations are drawn, bringing their sacrifices of gold and frankincense and spice for the altar, myrrh. Where have we heard that before? This new Jerusalem will be the place where all God's justice and blessings will flow out to all the nations of the world. Yes, the image is one of a new creation where heaven and earth meet, where God and his righteous servants dwell together. After all, at the root of it all, we are all sisters and brothers, one family called to represent God in the world. Through the suffering servant king, whom we know to be Jesus, God creates a covenant family of all the nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice and bringing a renewed creation where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. So how do the people respond to this servant? How do we respond to him. Well, we'll ponder that question, but first we'll sing together from CH4 only, number 374, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe.
So how do the people respond to the Messiah? Well, the wicked reject him and God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry. The, the wicked are those who create boundaries around themselves, who refuse to see others as sisters and brothers and deny justice to the weak, to the other, who refuse to share with those outside a share of the blessings. Well, Isaiah tells us that God is going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent of their own evil, they are forgiven and they will inherit the new Jerusalem as the blessing to the nations, which is an image for an entirely renewed creation where death and suffering are gone forever. His servants are those who embrace this renewed creation through the Messiah and who welcome the nations as sisters and brothers, who seek justice and peace, who share the good things that they have received so that no one is oppressed and none are excluded except by their own refusal. Here again, the words of God's chosen one from Isaiah chapter 61. And these, of course, are the words that Jesus spoke in Nazareth. The Sovereign Lord has filled me with his Spirit. He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives and freedom to those in prison. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. So, in Messiah Jesus, Christ Jesus, Eden is restored. As Jesus joins heaven and earth as head of his servant body. In this new Eden, this temple, justice and peace is restored and all people may find a welcome. The oppressed, the excluded, the stranger. And this servant life, this is who we are. As today, in our own day, we consider the challenges of our world, the politics of division, the fear of the foreigner, the need to welcome the refugee. And let's remember that even as we speak, 10 families from Afghanistan are due to be coming to Angus. As we remember these things, let us also remember our King. And let us remember that we are his servants. And as his servants, let us remember that we are those who represent God's character and live as his image according to God's wisdom. Those who embody God's promise within the unity of heaven and earth through following the way of King Jesus. So let us daily seek the Spirit's guidance to live that way today. Amen. Today, we dedicate the guild uh, that has begun to meet once more. And anybody who wants to join the, 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 the guild, uh, you are most welcome to do so. Uh, just get in touch and we'll put you in the, the right direction. Well, the, the Church of Scotland guild has been called by God to be uh, a body of God's servants in service and in fellowship. Its aim is to be a movement within the Church of Scotland which invites and encourages both men and women to commit their lives to Jesus Christ and enable them to express their faith in worship, prayer and action. The source of all our Christian love and service finds its source in the same Jesus Christ. Within the love of the one Father, in the power of the one Holy Spirit, together one God to be praised. So we ask God that we will be strengthened and blessed for his work. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you that you created the universe and that you have revealed yourself to us in human form in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. 
We thank you that he chose to identify himself with us and all humankind. With the Holy Spirit he declared your will and purpose, which is fulfilled upon the cross and made clear in his resurrection and glorious ascension. We thank you that in every great experience of life we have not been alone, but you are there as our saviour and friend. We thank you that you still dwell within us, refreshing us by your spirit and making us able to serve you in the world Christ Jesus came to save. So as we serve you, grant that we may find ways to serve also those whom you love, those who hunger and thirst, those who are strangers in need of rest, those who are naked and in need of clothing, the sick that require care, the prisoner who requires comfort. And as today we dedicate the Guild for another year, so we pray for the Guild and for its work throughout Scotland and overseas, and especially for its current projects. For Home for Good, which works to find homes for vulnerable children. For BEAT, who support people with eating disorders. For UNIDA, which helps to transform the lives of young Brazilians to be church leaders through education. For Star Child in Uganda, whose Finding the Light in Every Child project will address the challenges of stigma and myths related to intellectual and physical disability. For the Vine Trust and their project Create with Local Partners and Communities, a multifaceted and sustainable visitor, Kazunzu, in Tanzania, and for Chocolate Heaven, a kitchen providing employment for chocolate makers, fair prices for local growers, and sharing God's good news with their employees and wider community. These are ones whom you love, Lord. Grant that we serve them and you with a love that comes from your love and a spirit that is guided by your spirit. And especially today we ask you comfort, your comfort upon those who mourn. We pray for the ill and infirm, asking that your healing hand rest upon them to bring them to health. And as we think about our world, we ask that in this climate of uncertainty you guide those who have influence that together we may thrive in peace and justice as a blessing to the world. So for these and all our concerns, we seek your mercy and your blessing through Christ Jesus the King. Amen. We finish today with our final hymn from CH3 number 428, CH4 number 500, Lord of creation, to you be all praise.
Go, live and love in the knowledge of your oneness in Christ. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all.